uh, on the heels of th throwing out my striper shirt the other day, I want you to know I'm representing Guardian right now with a vintage Guardian tour shirt from 1993, the Miracle Mile Tour. Uh, Guardian, great throwback Christian rock band. If you know, you know. That's all I'll say about that. If you know, you know. I had such a good time getting on the other day and I've had some things that have been pressing on me. Um, still some, still some heavier things. So I wanted to, I wanted to take just a few minutes and get right in tonight, of course, is going to be our first presidential debate. And what I keep hearing about the election, I imagine that you're hearing this too, wherever you are. Well, hello, friend. Good to see you as well. Um, is that the election will largely be in the hands of, of the undecideds, of the undecided voters. And whenever I hear that, of course, I always think, all right, after walking through all of this before and being where we are now, who exactly are the folks who are the undecideds? Do you wonder about this? Who are the undecideds? Who are these undecided voters? But apparently they do exist, and I don't dispute the fact. Um, or maybe the people who voted a certain way before, but they're kind of on the borderlands now. I get it, the idea that the election will go to uh, to the folks who are yet undecided. In the spirit of that, I want to talk for a few minutes a day to people who on some spiritual matters, some theological matters, might still find themselves a bit undecided. Because as polarized as we are, as polarized and as polarizing of a moment as we're in, I do think there are a lot of folks who are undecided. I do think there are a lot of folks who are well-intentioned, but who legitimately don't know what to do with certain concepts, with certain words, especially if you grow up in particular theological context, um, things that are happening globally. And then you've got the fact that we as a species are taking more information into our brains in a single day than people would have in a lifetime before. And it is a, it's a wonderful and terrifying time to be alive in, in so many ways. So um, I, I, I want to talk specifically for a few minutes today about what's happening in Israel, Palestine, Gaza. Some of you heard me talk about this, uh, this before. But I want specifically to talk about theological framework, and some of you may not be interested in theological framework. You might, you may not need that, uh, but I think a lot of us do because I think how we think theologically, how we think about these larger questions of meaning, um, how we think about these larger values, how we think about these larger narratives, really does affect not just how we live in the world, but creates reality for our neighbors. I actually think one of the great uh, really most insidious lies of our time is th that people of faith and Christians in particular don't have power, when in fact we have tremendous power. We have tremendous political capital. We have tremendous financial capital. Um, any category of wealth influence that you can mark, uh, Christians in North America uh, have all of it. And yet, because there's a lot of narratives about uh, persecution and martyrdom that are largely invented. Uh, these become ways of getting out from under the power that we wield, and maybe to use a very different kind of word, different word other than power, the stewardship that I think we are called to. Um, there, you know, I think about Paul's language uh, that we are to be co-creators with God. Uh, when going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, right? That is the idea: is that God gives humans stewardship, and there's very much this idea that we take real responsibility over the world that we are creating, that we are co-creating with God. However, if you believe in certain theological inevitabilities, right, if you believe that there is a script, that things have to play out in particular directions, so, so long as you believe with the, that there's a script and you start with an end in mind, that's going to affect not just how you read the world, especially for those of us who do have positions of influence, affluence, power. It's, it's going to affect not just how we read. It's going to affect how we govern. It's going to affect um, all kinds of outcomes for our neighbors. So let me, let me nuance this a little bit by uh, telling you just a little bit about where I come from. So Growing up in a in a in a Pentecostal context, as I always say, son of a preacher who also was a son of a preacher. So you know, third third generation preacher. 
I grew up in an environment where I heard lots of sermons about the rapture and about end times. And while we were Pentecostal people, uh, we also very much uh, within those days, the sermons I heard uh, about the end times. And we had a lot of preachers and people I really loved who would put up the big charts. Uh, feel free to shout at me if you've ever been out there and seen the giant charts, the end times graphs that fill the stage. We had a lot of those kind of charts and uh, those charts and graphs largely came out of a particular theological system that we call dispensational dispensationalism. And the idea of dispensational theology is it's a it's a very particular way of reading scripture uh, that kind of starts with revelation and goes backward. Uh, you have this notion that the seven churches, the seven very real churches that John writes to in the book of Revelation represent seven church ages. And you think about the world, you think about history in terms of these seven church ages. And so then you have a very, very a very rigid timeline. Uh, here's what happened in these couple hundred years and the couple hundred years after that, and everything builds to, uh, you know, and it gives you a very linear, um, as, as I think is often the case, with a lot of great errors actually in theological history, only lawyers would come up with reading a way of, of scripture like this, because really it's not intuitive. It's not intrinsic to the, to the text at all. In other words, if you gave somebody a Bible, and they're reading it for the first time in a cell somewhere. Nobody is going to come up with seven church ages and dispensations and all of that. But this very elaborate, uh, not just theology, but eschatology, this way of thinking about the end of the world, um, became re was really part of the gospel for us and was seemed as clear and as apparent as John 3.16. And a big part of that theology, that eschatology, uh, also had to do with very particular ideas about what was supposed to happen in the Middle East. Um, using a handful of verses from Ezekiel and from Isaiah, and again, then from Revelation, uh, there was this idea that the nation state of Israel was going to be regathered. And um, as we had already picked up momentum in that time, uh, the idea was that it had been regathered supernaturally in 1948 that Israel as it currently exists as a nation state is a continuation of uh, the Israel that we read about in Genesis of that covenant that uh, that's made to Abraham, that there, there is an unbroken link between Israel as we read about it then and Israel as we see in the news now. And that in order for God's purposes to be accomplished in the world, um, the the fate of Israel's as nation state was is, is very crucial, of course, because if you recall that covenant that God makes to Abraham, God says, uh, you know, to Abraham, man named Abraham, I'm going to not only make your name great, I'm going to give you this great family, I'm going to give you this great people. Um, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I'd like to come back to that in a minute. Through you, all the families will be blessed. But you'll also recall in the Abrahamic covenant that God says that those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. And we took that very seriously. So the idea then is, you know, in our minds was very much anybody who wants to be on God's side better bless the nation state of Israel. And anyone who curses the nation state of Israel speaks ill, speaks critically of the nation state of Israel in any form is not uh, just on the wrong side of history. You're on the wrong side of, of God himself. And uh, that was the narrative that we were. Uh, that we were largely given. These days, I, it seems pretty ironic to me in some ways that uh, even growing up as a Pentecostal, that we were into this kind of dispensational theology because not trying to get too far in the weeds here, most dispensational theology as it came about through um, the Schofield Study Bible, as it came about through um, a, people, a guy named Darby and others, really does it allow room for the Pentecostal movement, gifts of the spirit, that's another thing for like another time. But at any rate, it's what we're into. And I can tell you that what broke me open, not just about these things, but probably about everything else in my life, if I'm honest, I, I, I think about it often. It's like the great hinge point in my life was when I met a woman named Sister Margaret Gaines. And I hope that those of you who know me don't get ever get bored with me talking about Sister Gaines. Um, a friend and a mentor of mine, Dr. Ricky Moore, sent me a, a sweet text yesterday about Sister Margaret. And I just, I find myself, 
thinking about her every day of my life and probably thinking about her now more than ever, honestly, thinking about her life and her legacy, uh, though she's been gone for a few years. This, uh, this Pentecostal saint who um, went to the mission field, 19 years old, uh, Tunisia first, but ultimately lands in a little village called Abu, tiny little Palestinian village, Christian village, where, by the way, uh, Christians and Jews and Muslims had lived largely at peace for hundreds of years and historic, but also a place where historically Christian families had been displaced in 1948. And I know a lot of those families really well now. And so Margaret is the, the Palestinian people very much became her people. She is this Pentecostal woman who also like me very much internalized all of that dispensational theology and absolutely um, believed all of it, right? That, uh, that Israel as nation state would have been critical for end times, you know, in order for Jesus to come back and set his foot. Um, you know, the, the, all, the prophecies have to be realized about the Temple Mount, like all of these things were in place for her, like it would have been for anybody. But her experience of being on the ground with real Palestinian Christians, uh, over time, begin to chip away at her theology. The way, incidentally, I find that living with real people, living with people's real stories in real life will alter your theology. And that's the way it's supposed to happen. Um, the way that you hear their stories and read their stories starts to change the way you read stories within the text of Scripture. That's the way it's supposed to happen. But one of the things I love about Sister Gaines, who is just such a incredibly devout, incredibly reverent woman. I mean, um, I, I tell this so often how, and it sounds like hyperbole, it's really not. To be in her presence, I've always said, is the closest I've ever come to being in the presence of Jesus. Uh, so often when I would be around her, uh, I would I would cry kind of out of nowhere. She she cried a lot because there there was this beautiful, like, heaviness yet lightness, a sweetness to her presence, uh, just that was otherworldly and yet very much present in this world, uh, tr tr truly a saint. Uh, see, this devout person who absolutely, you talk about having a, a, a high view of scripture and of the, uh, as, as the word of God, and uh, certainly a, a deep and abiding love for Jesus. But as her experience living with Palestinian Christians begin to sh change her theology, she's also reading these texts in a different way. And though she largely, and I find this interesting, did not throw out all of the framework that was given to her, um, some really basic things about the narrative begin to speak to her in a different way. Things like, for example, um, she had always heard, like I would have heard, that um, Jewish people and Muslim people have to be at war with each other and in enmity with each other because they're children of Abraham. And we know that the children of Abraham have always been at odds. And uh, as she's spending time in these, in these very Jewish texts, in these Hebrew, Hebrew texts, she's um, coming away with things like, wait a second, actually Abraham's sons reconciled in the death of Abraham and they buried their father together in peace. And there's really nothing in this narrative that suggests that there needs to be some kind of a rift uh, between the children of Abraham, as if God calls for this, or as, as if scripture necessitates this in some ways. Uh, so she's, she starts thinking about these texts differently and hearing these stories very differently. And some of it was just from having experiences like, and you know, she, Margaret wrote about this in her books, um, the experiences of being in a booth, very peaceful village um, where Israeli troops would come in at random uh, on these raids and do things like mow down the olive trees that were the pride and joy of the village for no discernible reason whatsoever. Um, she referred to uh, some of the soldiers as thugs, by the way, pretty strong language for the most soft, tender person I've ever known in my life. Uh, but again, being around the, the real stories of people who are living this life in the trenches very much begin to alter the, her, the, the shape of her theology in this way. And as, as Margaret's uh, journey began to change her, she started talking openly about the fact that she felt like, uh, and he, hear this distinction, because language does matter, words do matter, and we're going to make some clear linguistic uh, distinctions uh, here. 
Margaret would not only would she have been fiercely uh, not anti-Semitic and deeply loved Jewish people, she would have said that the state of Israel uh, had a has a right to exist, which, by the way, used to be the definition of Zionism is simply that you believe that uh, Israel as a nation state has a right to exist. Um, Margaret would not have disputed any of those things and had a deep love for Jewish people. But what she did come to believe is that much of what was happening in the world, in her world, and certainly in the Middle East, and certainly with her people, was the product, and I love this phrase, of the meddlesome zealotry of the church, attempting to force the end before the time, was the phrase that she used. And she saw even then, and keep in mind, this is long before the moral majority, this is before the religious right as we know it now, uh, but Christians even then, in such a place of power, who had the same charts and graphs that we did, were calling shots and they were pulling on certain evangelical kinds of sensitivities. And she's seeing the way, okay, people are being sold a narrative that says peacemaking is not possible, war is inevitable, violence is inevitable. And and I, I'm gonna say this how I feel it in a way that I think actually is really, is, is, is dark and, and pretty vile. Um, actually, this kind of violence is necessary for our own salvation. We want the Lord to come. We want to be rescued up out of this mess in a rapture. And the more people that were slaughtered, the more pain, the more suffering, almost the better, because it would seem to even hasten the return of the Lord. Margaret got real, got real hard and real serious about these things. Um, there is a book of hers I would definitely want to recommend to you called Small Enough to Stop the Violence. Uh, I don't have a copy of that book on me. I don't mean to be self-referential. The closest thing I've got, I wrote a little Advent book this past year called The Book of Waiting, where I quoted a an excerpt from Margaret here that I want to be able to share in terms of just a, a bit of where she where she lands with this. And specifically this um, this question, not only of how we think about Israel's nation state, but the, the church's role in shaping these geopolitical realities. Savannah, thank you for preaching with me. Um, and she says, the church, instead of fulfilling the Lord's last will and testament, which is to go tell every nation, tongue, and people the good news that God loves them and wants to restore them, is misappropriating their God-given health, knowledge, and wealth to try and force the end before the time. Jesus indicated that when the church finishes this missionary assignment, then the end will come. And note, uh, Margaret would have been a person who very much still would have been talking about the, re the return, the bodily return of Jesus. Maybe the church should get on with the assignment and leave the matters of the temple to the Messiah of Israel, the singular son of Abraham and son of David, who is the rightful heir to the promises, even our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this phrase, because I think this is so powerful. For do we even realize what effect the end time zealotry of the church is having on current events, even on the level of violence? Now, she wrote that in 2001, 2001, um, very different time. And yet in so many ways is the story not always the same. Uh, do we even realize what effect the end time zealotry of the church is having on current events, even on the level of violence? I, I, I want to read a little um Another little excerpt from Margaret here in a couple minutes, but maybe by way of rounding this out, uh, since I telling you a little bit about Margaret and her influence on my life and on my story and where I'm kind of situated there, it also feels important to to tell you this in terms of a little bit about where I live now and how I live now and what matters to me. Uh, so for the last couple of years now, uh, I have been the director of the Center for Spiritual Life at DePaul University. Obviously, whenever I'm talking about things like this. I'm certainly not speaking on behalf <laughs> of any of any sort of institution. But one of the really wonderful things about what I get to do is that I work really closely with our Rabbi Bruce Pfeffer, with our mom, uh, Ahmed Almin, uh, one of my d dearest mates. Like these are my brothers. I love them so much. And uh, so part of what that means is that in the same way that over the these years, I've been so deeply shaped by the stories of Palestinian Christians in particular. I, I've been in the Middle East more so than any other part of the world. Uh, it's the most radical hospitality I've experienced anywhere in the world. And there's a lot I could say, I could say about that. Uh, but in these last few years, 
my experience of being received in our Jewish community has been uh, just unbelievably profound. Uh, October 6th, the night before October 7th, I remember vividly what I was doing because uh, I, I always attend our Shabbat service and help support that with Rabbi Pfeffer, who was so generous to me. I'll, I'll never forget that that night, in particular October 6th, that he let me help him unroll and roll back up the Torah scrolls, which is certainly not something that somebody like me as an outside of the tradition would ever have the the uh the capacity to be able to do i mean it was just an extraordinary experience uh we were in our little our little uh interfaith space upstairs that night and as we were doing the the liturgy reciting the the prayers and uh and doing the readings that was the night too that uh, then we took turns um kind of marching and dancing around the room with the with the torahs and it was just a a handful of us, just um, just few enough to be awkward in the best kind of way. It's a really, really sweet memory just to think about uh, how precious that that celebration was. And uh, I, I think all the time now about what an extraordinary experience it has been for me to feel so fully received by our little Jewish community and and how powerful their witness is to me. You know, in a place like where I am in rural Indiana, when I think about our Jewish students, I think of our, our Muslim students who are, you know, an hour away from a synagogue or from a mosque, have so little support in that way in rural Indiana. And to see the kind of spiritual life that flourishes in them and getting to be part and around the table with them. I mean, it's an absolutely extraordinary thing. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time in these months with my Jewish siblings processing the pain and grief of October 7th. And the experience in some cases of feeling like that, uh, not being fully allowed to grieve, maybe in some ways. Um, I don't think I'm betraying any trust to say that most of my Jewish friends are deeply critical of the Netanyahu administration and of the policies of the Israeli government as it stands now. And yet also experience something, a lot, you know, just just so much pain after this terrible attack from Hamas, which I have no issues uh, d denouncing. I mean, it, so so it's like I, I'm holding that in in one hand uh, and take that very seriously. And yet, and this is where I'm kind of bringing this around to the people who I feel like right now are maybe almost the spiritual undecideds and don't always know what to do when all these words are being thrown at us. Um, at the same time, we read accounts where of, of anti-Semitism and protest. And I think for those of us who are Christians, especially, we always have to be so deeply sensitive to anti-Semitism because so much of it is deep in the water of our tradition um, in, in ways that are really uh, that, that are horrifying. On that note, if I can make a quick uh, recommendation to you, um, my dear friend Chris Green has written an amazing new book called The Fire in the Cloud of Biblical Christology. And it's the best theological resource I've ever read in terms of really, because there does seem to be a way like that, that Christianity, um, the, the quite whole question of whether or not it's even possible to articulate Christianity in a way that is not supersessionist, uh, that doesn't assume a superior posture to, to Judaism. Um, I don't think anybody has ever dealt with that theological question as robustly as Chris does and as, sensitive, as sensitively as he does in this book. It's it's absolutely a masterpiece, and I can't recommend it strongly enough to you. Um, those questions really matter to me. Um, as a person who celebrates all the Jewish holy days with our community and um, and, and listen, listening to the voices in our community, and yet at the same time, uh, we've been in this moment now for these last few months where I, I hear all these realities being collapsed. Um, as if to be critical of the Israeli government or the policies of the Netanyahu administration is somehow in itself uh, to be fundamentally anti-Semitic in some way. That that's that's just not true. I think we do have to be uh, careful and reflective in how we speak about these realities. Uh, one of the precious experiences I, I had at DePaul, it's like one of our um, I, one of our students in our in our Jewish student group. Uh, who was actually one of the elected officials, was also participating in a protest against the policies of Israel and the Netanyahu administration. And they brought her in to actually collaborate 
to but wanting to make sure that none of the language that would be used in the protests would be anti-Semitic in any way. And just the, the fact, not that everything then goes perfectly, but the fact that there even was such a conversation was just so so heartening to me. Uh, and yet oftentimes, though, this is this is the way that things are presented to us, right, is that uh, either we have to uh, ignore the, the realities that, especially in America, when we have two groups that are largely on the margins here and people project all kinds of things onto them, that somehow... Do we have to ignore either one of these things? Obviously not. Yes, we can be cautious and reflective. Uh, Spence said breaking the binary, and that's I think that's so helpful and so true uh, about ways that maybe we're even unintentionally anti-Semitic. I think that's really important. And yet at the same time, we're awesome in this framework. And I think it's, it is important for me to name this. I, I do really believe that Palestinian people are the most oppressed people in the world. Uh, and I don't think there's a close second. Most oppressed people in the world, uh, their stories are not told uh, in mainstream media. Uh, that that really is true. And that's where I think especially how we talk about what happened on October 7th, which was horrible uh, and inexcusable, but does get really complicated because all the stories that precede October 7th, um, these are things that I follow very closely. Uh, the The... The atrocities of Israel as nation state are not things that tend to get a lot of coverage in America, in American media. And I feel like I need to be nuanced even in how I say that. But see, this is why I think it's important that we just because we have to be precise when we speak doesn't mean we cannot speak. This is not a way of saying uh, something like the old trope that there is a small group of, uh, of Jewish people that control the media and the world or whatever. Once again, speaking, speaking about Israel, which is largely a secular state to begin with, is not the same thing to speak about um, Jewish people at large anyway. Uh, but no, what the specific thing I want to focus on, uh, to use a great U2 lyric, outside it's America, y'all, outside it's America, the whole world is becoming America. It is American economic interest that drives uh, the news that we get and the news that we don't get far more so than anything else. And there are reasons as uh, uh, always connected to economics that we are not going to hear stories of particular kinds of people where we come from. Uh, but for right now, I'll just leave it with Palestinian people are the most oppressed people in the world. This has always been true. And while the Netanyahu administration has been especially brutal, um, there have been so many atrocities. And if you try to name them as such, uh, there's a wonderful documentary on Jimmy Carter called Men, uh, Men from Plains. And you see Jimmy Carter, who's what was already just so deeply beloved by everybody until he wrote a book called Palestinian Peace, Not Apartheid. And the fact that he used the word apartheid, suddenly Jimmy Carter, um, famously humble, obviously not anti-Semitic, a man who deeply loved Jewish people, but loved Palestinian people, simply uh, describing the realities on the ground the way any reputable human rights organization is going to describe. The, the, just naming, giving accurate language to the extremely unjust treatment uh, that he saw to Palestinian people. And what you'll see in the documentary Man from Plains is the way everybody comes with pitchforks, because that's what happens. You're not allowed uh, to, to speak these things. Ultimately, in a way that has nothing to do with some cabal of Jewish people, but because they ult this ultimately goes against American economic self-interest. And all of this angst that somehow gets projected on, if you say these things, you're anti-Semitic. Say it one more time. Outside, it's America. By the way, I have to interrupt Fro right now that Brother Kevin Pauls just uh Shouted out my guardian shirt. I'm just glad anyone feels me and understands me here. <laughs> Thank you for that, brother. But yeah, I mean, it's a it's a, it's a very real thing. And then people feel like, and which is what we see right now. It's like there's no moral clarity at all about things where there really should be moral clarity because people are are, are just scared out of their minds uh, to say anything about much of anything for fear of using the wrong words. And I'm convinced a lot of that. This is really not a moment not to speak. I think it is a moment to listen to our neighbors and to listen to their pain and to listen with humility. And when we speak, I think we've got to speak with tenderness. I think we've got to speak with a lot of care. I can tell you right now, because of uh, certainly 
as shaped as I am by my experience with the Jewish community that I not only love, but I, by, by grace, I'm allowed to to participate in the way that they the way that they do. It's so meaningful. Uh, you better believe I'm going to listen very seriously to any critique of language that's used that's going to make them feel marginalized or um, is going to recall things historically or currently that feel painful. I'm, I'm going to be super sensitive to that. And yet I absolutely think there is a way to speak to what's happening uh, right now through the policies of Netanyahu and the nation state of Israel in ways that are clear um, that 40,000 people dead, mostly women and children, genocide is not an overreaction. It, it, is, it is the only word. And there has to be a way that, um, that Christians of all people should be able to speak to this and name this, but they can't. They can't because they so often are trapped in a theological framework that doesn't allow us to, to, to speak to reality, doesn't allow us to even uh, almost, almost believe in reality. I, I know this is getting a little ambitious, but if you'll bear with me for just a couple more minutes, let me just walk, walk you through something right here. And I want to do this very carefully because I'm so aware as a Christian that everything about my faith is a gift from the Jewish tradition. Uh, it's all, we, we've, we've begged, we've borrowed, we've stolen um, in so many ways. And especially given the, the history of uh, the, the atrocities, the anti-Semitism um, throughout Christian tradition, not just now, but historically. Uh, again, I think we have to speak very carefully about these things, but consider the, the, Consider this for a second. So if the the, the Hebrew story uh, that's mediated to us as Christians now begins with um, God's covenant to Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make your family great. Through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed, right? Um, and, and we see, and I, I want to make sure I, I, I say this carefully because I don't feel like the New Testament actually corrects anything here. What we see in the Hebrew story, in the Jewish story, is that the story was always moving from family story, familial story, tribal story, tribalistic story, to universal story, universe, universalistic story, whole world, whole world. I didn't come up with that language. That's what we get in Genesis. The whole world will be blessed through the covenant that God makes with Abraham. And what we see through the Hebrew Bible is we see the unfolding. We see the story, how the story just keeps getting larger and larger and it keeps expanding. And the prophets are constantly expanding the consciousness of the priest in ways that become more and more inclusive. Uh, we see the way the story just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's how the Jewish story works. If we did not have a New Testament, if we did not have a story of Jesus of Nazareth, we get entirely within our Jewish scriptures, a broad, inclusive, expansive story about how a covenant that was made to one man, one particular man in a particular place and uh, who, who began a particular people, this God who raises up Abraham and then raises up Moses and delivers Israel up out of Egypt, how that story is going to be not just about the salvation of Israel, but ultimately will be a light to the nations. That was the promise from the beginning. Uh, this is thunder throughout the prophets, a light to the nations. What was happening in Israel was to be a light to the whole world. And before, uh, long before the arrival of Jesus, this is already where the story is moving. This is already what's happening, right? So putting that on the shelf then for just a second, how do how how then do do Christians understand this? Well, I, I mean, if I think there's anything that's fantastic, uh, if there's any unique gift that the Christian tradition brings to the world, I think it's this idea that um, this emphasis that the, the the God's chosen, God's beloved people are not defined by family, by biology by borders, by nation state. I mean, that's what we get over and over again in the New Testament. Again, I would contend it's in the Old Testament as well. But I think it's so emphasized within the New Testament. Um, who, who are the people of God? Uh, they are all those who believe, no matter where they live, as Paul will say, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, 
right? Male nor female. Uh, there are not boundaries on this. There are not borders on this. There are not geographical parameters on this. This is to all who believe. And if you've not been born into the right place, into the right family, there's room for you, right? Because this is now a, 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 a family for all who believe. That's where this, that's where this story is always, you know, has always been going. But unfortunately, what we have in a lot of this in times theology, to come all the way back to where I started with this kind of dispensationalism, is you have this emphasis on a really rigid emphasis on Israel as, as a nation state. Please hear what I'm saying. Um, if you don't, if, if you come to a place where you don't believe that, uh, which was very much what Sister Margaret believed, that Israel as a nation state now is not somehow a direct continuation of some promise that God made in the Old Testament. That doesn't mean that you, again, don't believe that Israel should have a right to exist or, or that you're anti-Semitic or any of those kinds of things. Rather something more like um, that uh, Israel as a nation state now should be held to the same kind of standards as any other nation. I, I, imagine that. If y'all want to know where this is going and you're getting concerned, I, I can tell you what's at the bottom of the slippery slope. Here's the theological liberalism your mom worried uh, warned you about. What if you actually came to a place where you were able to articulate that killing in general is wrong? Could you imagine that? I, I imagine coming to a place where you might could believe um, that that killing is not good, uh, that that slaughter of women and children does not accomplish the purposes of God, that uh, people don't need to die in order for God's redemptive purposes to be accomplished in the world. I mean, can, 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 can you imagine that? Is, that? is that way too bitter of a pill to swallow? Uh, that if there is a God that's good and that is benevolent and not malevolent, and the center of the mystery is actually love, that love doesn't require murder in order to get the job done, is that just utterly incomprehensible to you? Um, this, I just think for those of us who profess any kind of a belief in a love for Jesus, this is where you have to land. But And I, I know I'm opening all kinds of cans of worms, but I hope you see how connected this all is. The, the, the trouble, right, is that people start with the book of Revelation and a particular understanding of the book of Revelation, and they work backwards, not the other way around. And you just can't do that. You have to interpret revelation through the lens of what comes before. Uh, now, here's what I and here's what I mean when I say that there are a lot of people who who will kind of cherry pick. Uh, well, look, we see violence and mayhem in the Old Testament, and we have these violent apocalyptic images in the Book of Revelation. So much so that what we get in the Gospels is barely even uh, mentioned. Right? Uh, not only in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, but the ultimate revelation of God, Jesus on the cross, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Um, the, the fundamental identity of, of God that's revealed in this self-giving, self-sacrificing love is barely even a footnote to get to wrathful Jesus who's coming back uh, to, to vindicate the people of God over against their enemies. And we want to make sure that we're just on the right side of of all of that. I mean, there are all kinds of things I could I could say about it. But um, I, I think one of the things that I've been sitting with a lot here lately is that is the, the comedy that the way this has always been presented to people and the way that it was presented to me is that this is a literal reading of the book of Revelation. That this is because we, we honor the text so much because we revere scripture so much. We read it, we read it literally. Um, there are a whole lot of things I think that are different between about, you know, kind of reading literally than, than taking seriously. But I would just want to offer this at the ground level. They're not reading it literally. Dispensationalism is super strange in that way, actually, because the only literal characters in the book of Revelation are the figure of John himself and the seven churches. They turn John into a metaphor for the church caught up in rapture. They turn the seven churches into seven church ages. And then everything that comes after that dragons, beasts, all of this language that is obviously intended to be allegorical, that is obviously intended to be representative. Uh, and, and, and then they empty the allegorical significance out of all of that. Uh, it just creates all kind of mayhem and, and chaos. Um, and, and 
goodness, there's just there's just so much I'd want to say about that. Uh, it's it's a way of reading Revelation upside down because you miss the whole point. You miss the whole point. Um, there's violent apocalyptic imagery in the book of Revelation, but what is the story trying to tell you? People laugh and sneer when I say this, and I understand, uh, but I will say it flat-footed, looking straight at the little camera anyway. I will contend that Revelation read rightly might be as expli explicitly of a nonviolent book as we have in the Bible. I know, I, I know you don't buy it. What do you th what do you think it actually means that all of Revelation climaxes in a giant battle scene in which Jesus comes out wearing a robe that's dipped in his own blood, in which there is not bloodshed, that Jesus gains his victory over the forces of death, hell, and the grave through a a war, through a battle in which no enemies are killed. What do you think is going on there? The the meaning of the story, what Revelation actually reiterates over and over again through a series of images that are not in chronological order is that the lamb overcomes through self-sacrifice. It keeps showing us that over and over again. The lamb has overcome through self-sacrifice. It is not through the slaughter of God's enemies, but it's through the sacrifice of the lamb himself that these forces have been overcome. And, and, and if you don't, if you don't believe me that any of the language gets allegorical, I, I'm, I'm, Still going to do another live here in a minute to talk specifically about hell. What do you do with the fact that Revelation 19 says that hell, Hades, the exact word, Hades is thrown into the lake of fire. I mean, there's all kinds of um, allegorical things that are happening here. But the point, if you know how to read literature, is that God overcomes the forces of violence and chaos in the world through self-sacrifice. Yet you've got people who read Revelation put it alongside a handful of other Old Testament texts taken out of context and somehow turn this into uh, God needs the nation state of Israel now. The nation state of Israel now is perfect and right. The good people will be on their side. The bad people are on the other side. Uh, goodness, I, I always want to uh, you know, answer all the, all the objection of the critics I even hear in my head. Um, Israel's not the only nation state that has problem. Oh, well, then who do you think's right? Like Saudi Arabia? No, but Saudi Arabia has not killed 40,000, mostly women and children, right? I mean, yeah, uh, do it, yes, I think Hamas needs to be denounced, but these, all of this, ha you know, happens within a context. And to me, it would be such a big step forward for a lot of us to simply get to a place of to just not believe that all of this has to play out according to a certain kind of script in order for God's purposes to be accomplished in the world in some way. That's the thing that drives me so bananas is that when people then see violence and mayhem, they say, oh, well, this is happening according to the script. This is what has to happen. People have to die. People have to be slaughtered. I understand that there are plenty of apocalyptic texts that talk about terrible things that will happen in in times last days. But y'all, terrible things have been happening for a long, long time. And when I look back throughout history, tell me where you'd like to tag out and like to live. You want to live in the in the Middle Ages? Do you, would you want do you want to live through the bubonic plague? Do you want to live through the Civil War? Do you want to live through World War II? Exactly uh do do we want Jim Crow laws again? Uh do we want a Holocaust again? Tell me exactly where it was in history that we're not apocalyptic end times. Savannah just said, easy to say when you're not the one being slaughtered. That's exactly right. And this is my point precisely, is that because we're not the ones being slaughtered, then it becomes easy to say, oh yeah, well, here's here's where it fits in the script. Praise God. Uh, and then we just accept these things for the way that for the way that they are. We accept reality as it's been given to us. When I would contend all of scripture really um, kind, of, kind of hangs on this idea. God, God creates humanity and gives us, this is, not, this is not a great word for the way that we use it, dominion, uh, but the idea really is stewardship. God gives us stewardship over the world. God gives us stewardship over the creation. And now you have Christians who in the West who are the most influential, affluent people in the world, but don't believe they have influence or affluence don't think it matters that no, no, the very fact that you have adapted this morbid script that says everybody has to die is going to mean people are going to have to die. Um, 
I believe that there's a way that you almost end up willing this into existence. Um, you, we don't have a reason to uh, to to cheer peacemaking or peacemakers. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of evangelical groups support uh, support causes that kind of actively encourage disruption in the Middle East in particular. They don't, of course, they don't have an invested uh, interest in peacemaking because we're driving a rental car. And you know that when you're driving a rental car, it's not like driving your own car, is it? <laughs> Nobody takes care of a rental car like they're driving their own car. No, it's like we're, we're on borrowed time. This world is not my home. I'm just a stranger passing through. Uh, good old gospel ship, blah, blah, blah. Y'all, uh, I really don't know how to tell you what a holy hatred I have for all that kind of language. Uh, as a person who absolutely believes in the resurrection and who and afterlife and like in all of the things. But I'm just so convinced that there has to be some kind of continuity between what God's doing here and now and what's to come. Uh, if any man, if any person be in Christ, they're a new creation. All old, old things pass away. All things become new. Um, for, for those of us who are Christians, we we understand that salvation means that when you come to Christ, you don't have like new skin. You don't get like a new face. You're the you're a new you and yet you're the old you. Well, that's how it will be when God restores all things. Um, Romans 8 talks about how the earth itself, the creation itself is groaning and sighing, sighs too deep for words, for the manifestation of the children of God. The, the world is waiting on the children of God to take their place. And yet when the children of God are kind of sitting at the bus stop waiting for Jesus to come and really just waiting for slaughter and mayhem to happen, uh, yeah, I think it creates all kinds of of, of terror in the world that, that's utterly unnecessary. And a lot of what it has to do with is people of faith not taking stewardship, um, not having a sense of the right kind of ownership for our brothers and sisters. We are our brother's keeper, uh, and we are very much connected. We are very much connected to our Jewish siblings and to our Palestinian siblings. And again, this isn't about um, choosing sides. It is very much about choosing sides against violence, against oppression, um, against injustice in whatever form that we see it, wherever we see it. And if you can just get the theological script, get that clutter out of the way so that almost returning to kind of a, a, a ground zero. Can you imagine that? that? That's that's really where I want to, to, to land this, actually. Um, what if you were able to hear real stories from real people in the world and hear them without that filter and actually allow those stories to take you wherever they're going to take you? Do you remember how Jesus tells Peter? there was a time in your life where you dressed yourself and you went wherever you chose, but that the time would be coming where you will be led where you would not choose to go. That's what happens when you break the theological script and you actually live in the world vulnerably. The, the frailty of real people in the world around you will lead you places that you would not choose to go. But, I'm convinced that is the disruption of the Holy Spirit uh, when people's real stories break into our lives in a way that's disruptive. That's what happened to Sister Gaines. Once she came to Abood Village, she couldn't live according to the script anymore. This It, it broke the script open. Uh, and it, 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 it broke open the way that she read scripture. It broke open the way that she was reading the lives of the people around us. I, I think we have to still be adaptable in that way. We have to still be um, changeable in that way. Um, that, my whole thing of kind of starting off this sort of riff to like the undecided, see, this is my this is my thing right now that's really animating me. I'm just convinced that we've decided a whole lot of things can't be changed because we're convinced that God would not allow it. Oh, last days, end times. Hey, whatever tremors and travail are happening in the world, y'all, there are a whole lot of things that are within our power to fix. They just are. They're just within our power to fix. And this like hokum that people go around with of like, oh, there's nothing you can do about this or that. I, I really, I, I just, I really get tired of hearing people talking about problems that are actually solvable as if they're not solvable. Um, Australia had one mass shooting. 
And because the, the will of the people was there for the government to say, yeah, no more of that, that problem was solved. But here it's always like, well, no way we could ever do anything about these crazy guns. It's just, it's just ludicrous. Uh, I just see this in all kinds of directions right now. This is the way that theology murders people in real life is because people are so convinced that their God needs people to die in order for these redemptive purposes to be accomplished in the world. Then, you know, the, the things that we don't actively perpetrate, and there are a lot of those, at minimum, we just passively let it happen. Because like, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, eh, what's that? Who needs who needs peacemaking? Nothing we can do about this anyway. It all has to fall apart. Who told you? How do you know? Uh, I'm perfectly happy if Jesus comes back tomorrow, because I'm convinced that Jesus is good, and whatever it means for Jesus to return will mean goodness to the world. So I'm perfectly happy if Jesus comes back tomorrow. But what if he doesn't? What if your grandkids are still here? What if your grandkids actually have to drive this car? What if your grand grandkids still have to live in this house that you act like you have no stewardship over, that you just we're just strangers passing through, we're just going to burn it down? We don't really know. We just hear strange things and read, you know, various memes on social media. Nothing we can really do about this. Yeah. What if your kids and grandkids actually are going to have to live in this world that we're co-creating? And what if the only people who can change it are us because we're the people who are here? And the idea is not actually that we let off the gas and we just let things play out the way it's going to play out. But what if to, again, to return to Paul's imagery and language, what if it's something more like the earth is groaning and sighing and longing for the manifestation of children of God, like people who really take seriously what it is to be stewards, people who really take seriously what it is to love their neighbors and to live in self-sacrifice and to and to live in humility and to uh, and to live out the radical things they read in the Sermon on the Mount. And yes, to read out the radical message of the book of Revelation that self-sacrificial, self-giving love conquers all. I'm convinced the whole world is waiting on that, which I don't mean in some weird way like the, the world's waiting on us Christians. But I do think there is a thing. I think there is a there is a spirit thing that I see in Beekner's phrase here and there, now and then in the world, uh, <laughs> in Christians, sometimes not in Christians, in all kinds of unexpected places uh, that, that changes things, that changes communities. And uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm getting real preachy right now. Thanks for hanging out with me uh, for a few minutes <laughs> for, <laughs> for all of this wildness. Uh, I, I really do believe this, though, and I hope you'll sit with this a bit. I hope you'll contemplate because um, I, I truly if you're discouraged, if you're in despair, I'm convinced all hope is local. And uh, if, if if you're not feeling hopeful, it's I don't mean that it's like a kind of judgment. I, I'm discouraged more often than not. But whenever I'm on the ground doing the things I really feel called to do, in my own community, that's where the hope comes from. And I'm telling you, there's real ways that you can affect change. There's real ways that you can, um, through the Spirit of God, change the temperature in the room where you are. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Don't let anybody tell you that there's a script that you just have to go along with. Uh, those folks are lying to you. They might be well-intentioned, but they're lying to you. Uh, they might be kind people, but they're false prophets. Stop listening to them. And start listening to people who are actually giving you resources and tools to actually be the kind of person who brings a real spirited, spirit led change in the world uh, through humility, through self sacrifice, through love of God, love of neighbor. That's uh, that's where it is. <laughs> Thank you for that, friend. So good to see you. We'll uh, we'll do this again real soon.